Um, this is going to be about the TOEFL reading inference question. So I'm going to share my screen with you right now so that we can talk a little bit more about this question. And the reason why I wanted to talk about it is because a little while ago I posted on Facebook uh, an inference question and many students responded answering the question, getting their practice in, which is awesome. But so many of them were so surprised when they found out the correct answer. And they were kind of debating, like, why is this one right? Why is this one wrong? And um, how do I figure this out? And they had a lot of questions and it started a lot of conversation. So I really wanted to focus on the inference question because I think it's one that, um, is really important to understand and when we understand it of course our score goes up because we get this question right. So what I want to do first is just define what an inference correct question is and then talk about how you answer it correctly. What are the trap answer choices? Now the trap answer choices are the things that TOEFL puts in the exam they look really good. They look so good. We want to choose them, but they're wrong. Okay. And it's like when you know what these trap answers look like, TOEFL uses the same types of traps all the time on every single multiple choice question. When you know what they look like, when you know what they are, then you know better than to choose them. And when you eliminate the tra trap answers, you're left over with the correct answer. And so our last bit is how can I eliminate traps to arrive at the correct answer? All right, so let's um, just define what the inference question is. An inference is a conclusion. So an inference question asks you to find the most likely conclusion based on the information in the reading passage. So I underlined here most likely conclusion, and that is so important. The inference question is not a fact detail question. You know, the fact detail question um, might ask us how many cups are mentioned, and we go to the text, and the text says three cups. Okay, so the answer is three, because the text directly says so. With an inference question, it works differently. We get the information in the reading passage, and the inference question wants us to make a logical conclusion based on that information. So it's not something that's directly stated in the passage, but it's something that we can infer. It's something that we can make a conclusion about, and that conclusion is 99.99% probably true, okay? And I wanna emphasize this as well, and I just wanna take a moment. What I mean by probably true. So if you ask me to go to the movies with you, for example, and I say, well, it's possible, maybe. I'm 50-50, right? Maybe I'll be there, maybe I'm not gonna be there, but it's like a 50% chance I'll be there. That's possibly true. But probable, you know, if I said to you, yeah, I'll probably go. Now you know I'm 80, 90, maybe 99%, probably certain that I'm gonna be there, okay? So the difference between possible and probable is a big one. And that's what you wanna be aware of on this question. Now, what does the question, um, the inference question look like on the TOEFL? You might see a question that says, which of the following can be inferred about? What does the author suggest? What is implied about? Or which of the following is probably true? Okay, your strategy. So when you see this kind of question, the first thing you wanna do, if the question mentions a detail or a keyword, Reread that detail or keyword in the reading passage. Now, sometimes this is not possible because the question might ask about the passage overall. 
And in that case, we do have to do some reading to be able to answer that question, maybe the whole text. But if it has a detail in it, go to the first mention of that detail, read about it. If that's the only mention, then that's the information that you're working with. Carefully look at each answer choice. Then eliminate answer choices that cannot be concluded based on the information in the reading passage. The inference question has a lot of elimination going on. Okay, I like to think of it as getting out your TOEFL sword and eliminating those choices that cannot be concluded. Okay, that are the possible, but not the probable. We want to eliminate the possible and choose the probable. So that's number four. Select the answer choice that is as close to the text as possible. It is the most probable answer choice. Okay, so let's do a little practice with this. Here's um, our first example. And the text is really short. It's just going to be one sentence. And the sentence says, the woman has been to Germany many times. Okay, what is implied about the woman? Now, we don't know much about the woman. All we know is that she has been to Germany many times, but we can make a logical conclusion based on this. Okay, so we have two choices here. A, the woman speaks German. B, the woman does not usually reside in Germany. Okay, so A says the woman speaks German. It's possible that she speaks German because she has been to Germany many times. So it's possible that she does speak German. But again, we're looking for the most probable. And B says the woman does not usually reside in Germany, which means to live there. So if she has been to Germany many times, we can probably conclude with certainty, with high probability, that she doesn't usually live there. Correct answer is B. This is the most probable because she traveled to Germany, she wasn't already living there. A is incorrect, okay? This is the trap I want you to watch out for. This is possible, right? But is it the most probable? No. It could be that she visits Germany but cannot speak the language. Here's our second practice inference. Here's the sentence. I've been to Turkey, England, Canada, and China. What can be inferred based on the sentence above? Okay. A, do I like to travel? B, I have a passport. C, I've flown on a plane. D, I have visited three continents. Now, A, I like to travel. Is it possible? Sure it is. I've been to Turkey, England, Canada, and China, which is true, by the way. Um, it's possible I like to travel, but do we have enough evidence based on this sentence to determine that? No. B, I have a passport. It's possible I have a passport. I've been to all these different countries, but it's also possible I'm some kind of criminal well, going into these countries without my passport. Okay, so we don't, again, we don't have enough information to conclude that I do have a passport. I have flown on a plane. It might be possible that I went to Turkey, England, Canada, and China by plane, but I don't have the evidence to make that conclusion, right? Maybe I walked to Canada. Maybe I took a boat to some of these places. We just don't know. But we do know we can determine with 99.99999% probability that I have visited three continents, right? This one, letter D, is our correct answer, okay? And I know what you're thinking. You're like, oh my gosh, you might be thinking this answer can't be right because it's too obvious. Exactly. 
choose the one that's as close as you can get to the actual text. Since England is in Europe, Turkey is in Asia and Europe, Canada is in North America and China is in Asia, then we can conclude with certainty that I have visited three continents. Okay, and I know you might be thinking, but this is the easy answer choice, it can't be right. This is how TOEFL loves to trap you. Sometimes the answer choice looks too easy. And then you start to guess, second guess yourself, like, oh, it's gotta be harder, it's gotta be more complex, there must be something I'm doing wrong. No, go with the answer that is most logical, most probably true, and it might sound like really close to what the actual text is saying. Okay, so now I wanna talk about a larger reading passage. I'm not gonna provide the entire reading passage here. You can view that in my course if you choose to take it. Um, but the reading passage I'll just give you a little summary is about Rosa Parks. And Rosa Parks was an activist during the 1950s and 1960s and during the civil rights movement in the United States. And at that time, um, segregation was, under the law, was allowed. And if you don't know what segregation means, it just means that Black people and white people were separated. So for example, if you went into a restaurant, you'd have separate seating areas. Um, if you went to a water fountain to get a drink of water in, in public, there might be one for black people and a separate one for white people. Uh, schools were segregated. There were black schools and white schools. And Rosa Parks, along with this a uh, wonderful man right here, uh, both wonderful people, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, they were both active in this time to end segregation because there was um, obviously injustice and disparity between the resources um, that were allowed um, and the access to things um, black people were denied access to. So um, in this kind of full length reading passage, we get the story of what Rosa Parks really did at this time. And um, I have this picture, it's a little bit blurry, but it is showing the activists on a bus. And so what Rosa Parks did was she, basically buses were also segregated, okay? So you had black people that had to sit in the back of the bus and white people could sit in the front. And if a white person came in and wanted that seat, the black person would have to stand up and give the white person that seat. And one day Rosa Parks um, on the bus, she was sitting there and um, that's what happened. A white person came up and she said, mm -mm, I'm not going to give up my seat as, as an activist. Okay, she knew she was going to take the stand on that day and say, no, you're not going to get my seat. And so what happened was she got arrested. Okay, so Rosa Parks was arrested for this. But what it did was it sparked this whole movement to um, basically boycott the bus. It meant that a lot of black people and, and also white people who were um, supporting um, this movement they refused to ride the buses anymore. Okay, so this was known as the Montgomery bus boycott, it took place in Montgomery, Alabama. And really Rosa Parks was the um, trigger, the, the, the point that set this whole thing off. Okay, so here's our inference question. What can be inferred about the US Supreme Court? So let's say we've read our passage and We've located in the passage that keyword U.S. Supreme Court, and it's right here. There it is, U.S. Supreme Court. So I'm just going to read this passage. It's the only place in the whole entire reading passage that the Supreme Court is mentioned. So it says, even insurance companies canceled auto insurance on the cars that black citizens were using to avoid the city buses. In November 1956, the Supreme Court ordered that Montgomery end its bus segregation. 
and the boycott ended as well. Black people began to ride buses again. The success of the boycott led to an increase in the number of peaceful, nonviolent protests enacted all over the South. Okay, so what we've got so far about the Supreme Court, again, we are, in the inference question, we're like detectives. We are hunting for the clues that we're gonna make that inference with. And already we've got some clues. We've got the Supreme Court ordered that Montgomery end its bus segregation. And the boycott ended as well. So Supreme Court ordered that this city, Montgomery, end its bus segregation. So let us now go to our question. What can be inferred about the US Supreme Court? A, it is comprised of nine judges. Now, wait a minute. Did you see anything back here in the reading about nine judges? No. Okay, so while it is true that the US Supreme Court is comprised of nine judges, it's actually true, this is outside information. It's not mentioned in the reading, we have to eliminate it. So this is when we get out our sword. Oh yeah, we get out our sword and we just eliminate that as an answer choice because it is not mentioned. Not mentioned. Okay. B, it enabled the civil rights movement to succeed. Well, we do have a mention of success. Let's read about it. So it says the success of the boycott led to an increase in the number of peaceful, nonviolent protests enacted all over the South. So Supreme Court makes a decision in segregation, bus segregation. Boycott ends. And now there's more peaceful protests. Do we have enough information, though, to say that the US Supreme Court enabled or caused the civil rights movement to succeed. Do we have enough information for that? We just know that they ended bus segregation in Montgomery. We don't really have enough evidence to say that the US Supreme Court enabled, caused the civil rights movement to succeed. Now, this is a trap that I like to call the false statement trap. But to be more specific, it's the false causality trap. Because we are giving a cause, like US Supreme Court caused the civil rights movement to succeed. And really, we, we can't make that conclusion because we don't have the evidence for it. And we also, know that there was a lot of other, according to the text, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, all of these people involved in peaceful protesting, they are the ones that really um, enabled the civil rights movement to succeed, and not really the US Supreme Court. Okay, let's move on to C. It has the power to overrule a state or city law. So the US Supreme Court has the power to overrule a state or city law. If we go back and look at what happened, Supreme Court ordered that Montgomery, which is a city in the state of Alabama, end its bus segregation. Wow. So I guess I can conclude with probable certainty that the Supreme Court does have the power to overrule a state or city law. They have the power to step in and do that. So C is looking our, like our most probable answer choice here. We've got one more. D, it, the US Supreme Court, was closely aligned with the NAACP and Martin Luther King Jr. Hmm. Were they closely aligned? Were they close? Well, it's possible that they were close. Maybe the US Supreme Court possibly was siding with these activists that wanted to end segregation. However, do we have evidence in this passage that says that? We don't. We just don't. 
Um, we just know they made this decision and we don't know if they were closely aligned with Martin Luther King and the cause or not. So this is possible, but it's not probable. C is the most probable. So after you got done slaying those trap answer choices, we come to the correct answer and that is C. The reading says that the U.S. Supreme Court ordered the city of Montgomery to end its segregation law on buses. Montgomery is in the state of Alabama, so it can be inferred that the U.S. Supreme Court has the power to overrule a state or city law. All right, so watch out for the traps again. You want to be that warrior with your sword, slay those trap answer choices. If it's not mentioned, like those nine judges, not mentioned, get rid of it. It's a false statement. Watch out for the false causality when you have it enabled or because or due to. These are all key words to watch out for. There are other ways to, you know, put a cause together. Um, but usually when you see this on TOEFL, it's usually a sign that it's a trap, that the, the text doesn't really say this caused that or this enabled that, but you have those two things happening, right? So it looks really good. It looks like a good trap. Um, you have these two things happening, but one did not cause the other to happen, okay? So watch out for that TOEFL trap. Watch out for the trap of not enough information. You just don't know. You don't have enough information to make that conclusion. It could be possible, but it's not probable. I hope this helps you with your inference skills. There are a lot more traps to know about, okay? I didn't list them all here, but there are a lot more traps to know about. And the more you practice this, the more you're able to see those traps and eliminate them, okay? To arrive at your correct answer. If you want more practice with the inference question, right now I have a free inference course available. It's on tofaland.com. So all you have to do is go to tofaland.com, go under courses, and you'll see that inference course. I drew that detective right there because you are the detective on the inference course, okay? And if you want more, I have free re resources at tofaland.com. I have a blog, um, practice questions, um, lots and lots of TOEFL tips. I also have a writing task number one course. You can schedule one-on-one -on -one tutoring with me to improve your TOEFL score. And I also offer help with the resume and personal statement writing, which is really, really, really important that you have someone to edit your materials because you want to present your best self. I offer writing help and coming really soon, I'm very excited about this, is going to be the TOEFL reading course. So imagine kind of the inference course that you'll see online from me, but for every single reading question there is, so that you'll know every reading question, you'll know how to answer them, you'll know all the traps and how to eliminate them. Also, please sign up for my newsletter at tofaland.com because that's where I keep you informed of when I'm gonna launch something new, when a new course is available, and um, I hope that um, those tips were helpful for you. Thank you so much for being here for our webinar and happy studying.